Welcome to Daily Watch Talks number 89. And we also have a plethora of watches here. It's a not plethora. Uh, yes. A horn of plenty. A horn of plenty. We have, uh, and we're, uh, we're going to discuss everything. We have, uh, uh, yeah, a, a variety of watches from all angles. I, I think what we have in front, the, um, the majority of it is square watches. It seems hip to be squared these days. Yeah, and we don't only have Swiss, we also have German watches. Yes. We're gonna and somewhat Italian. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's actually an Italian brand right now. We're going right to discuss is, yeah. Gerald, Gen- uh, sorry, Gerald Charles, Charles with their uh, novelties, the new Maestro. Maestros. We're going to discuss a bit Glashütte. Mm-hmm. We're going to discuss a bit Zenit. Mm-hmm. And I would like to hey, do an ode to the farewell Oh, uh, to the Uwak. Uwak. Yeah, that's a good that's, that's they're waving him out. Yeah. Uh, and a bit of Tudor. Yeah. Yes. So it's uh, uh, a big variety, and we hope you like it. Thanks for your emails. Thanks for your comments on the last um, uh, episode. Yes, this looks like AP. It does. And that was not on purpose, but. Petite w- pizzerie. <laughs> 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 Which actually means, I, I think, uh, a small wallpaper. Yeah. So this is a large wallpaper. A large this wallpaper. This is uh, isolation uh, materials for the studio here. Yeah. And we also thank you, Bo, for sending in your very thorough uh, uh, collection overview, asking us what to do. We're not going to discuss that today, but we'll think of it. And thank you very much for, for sharing it with us. Um, Where would you like to start? I think, shall we do... Gerald Charles. No, I think you need to do the ode to Uwerberg. Because we're going to introduce something now. Every time that we do a new podcast, Nick will reflect on the independent market. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. So that's why we're starting with the farewell ode to Uwerberg 105. Thank you, Christian. You're welcome, we don't have man. the jingle yet. We will that no. have. We will have a beautiful jingle in the next episode. But uh, yes, uh, it's no secret, I guess, that I'm a big fan and also a regular wearer of Uwerk. Mm-hmm. I like how different they are. Uh, the company is different. The policies are different, and you can compare them more to an artist than a commercial company. So Uwerk is concessionless and one of their concessions is that they don't do more than approximately 150 watches per year they don't want to grow they don't want to to jeopardize quality or the or the creative process so that means every now and then they have to kill their darlings they have to simply stop a successful line to make place for new creativity and new future models and the farewell is now to the to the 105 series the 105 is basically the successor of the 103 that we have here um, which was the first watch by Uhrwerk that had the wandering hour with the disc um, the, f- the 105 is following up on the disc that started in 2014 and now they have the farewell edition 12 pieces in tantalum which is a great app very heavy material tantalum it's heavy Yes. Yeah. And it's 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 yeah, it's a different material. We know it from FP Juan, we know it from uh, Panerai. Panerai, we know it from AP in the past. Um it's and it's it fits Uwerk. So they only do twelve, so they developed a tantalum case for twelve pieces, seventy seven thousand Swiss franc, and then it's adieu to the one oh five. So I'm looking forward what will be next, what will replace it. Um that was Uwerk. Thank you very much, Nick Today. Meyer. Next in line. Your let's, choice. Um, actually, I would like to talk about the Zenith. We all know that Zenith, uh, with the Chronomaster El Primero in 1969, was one of uh, the very first to introduce an automatic chronograph movement. Uh, quite unusual back in 1969, because most, well, all uh, chronographs were with a manual wind. This is an ode if you like. This is another revival from Zenith. It's a Chronomaster. Uh, it's inspired by a 1971 model. Uh, it has the overlapping uh, sub-registers and this wonderful ladder bracelet, if you like. It's on pictures, the ladder uh, bracelet just looks great. But when you open it, and I think it 
this is what the original looked like in, in 1971. It's such a flimsy clasp, but it fits the watch. And I have to admit that we, we, have, a, we have a whole box <laughs> of Zenith uh, Revival watches, also some of the new models coming out in yep. June 7, so we can't talk about them right now. They are amazingly cool watches. I love them. Uh, they fit me very well. This is my very infant youth. I was born in 1970, so one year after the introduction of the El Primero and one year before this uh, revival version was introduced in 1971. I like them a lot. I mean, I'm supposed to like the new ones, the new Defy, the new Chronomaster Sport, but this, these are fun. I'm just going to take off my Rolex Submariner with a green bezel. Wow, this, this is one. something. Yeah. And put this wonderful Zenith Chronomaster El Primero Revival. It's 37 millimeters, right? It's the original size. Yeah. I love this. This, I'm not going to say it makes a lot of sense. I just really like it. It's funky. It's fun. It's, it's my infant youth. My impression when I touched it, it, it doesn't, it's, it's not only looking like a, a, a 69 watch, it also feels like it. Yeah, the, the, the ladder bracelet with that flimsy clasp yeah. definitely uh, uh, makes sense, if you like. I'm glad they didn't modernize uh, the bracelet, uh, you know, to fit a modern clasp on it, because that would just be too much. Yeah. If you take the new Omegas right now and they want to reintroduce the look and feel of the uh, vintage bracelets and and yet the bracelet look good but the the clasps are just too thick mm. yeah that is not the case on this chronomaster revival from 1971 who is who is who should buy it is it someone like you a, a romantic like see you can't back you to your to to your to your childhood or is it also for a new type of Zenith customer. You can't say uh, 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 romantic when you're talking to a man. It has I'm to sorry. be nostalgic. Oh, yeah, you, you, you already told me that before. Nostalgic. Yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> I'm, I'm surprised how much I like it. Um, it's definitely a design piece, if you like. It has a very distinct look and feel. I think especially the ladder bracelet. Um, I don't know. I'm not quite sure about that. I, I think you have to know the story about the El Primero. You have to know about what happened in 1969, besides the moon landing. Uh, you have to know your story about uh, the Hoyer uh, Monaco and the Caliber 11. Uh, and the, uh, you know, the, the, the war between the brands in terms of coming up with yeah. the first automatic chronograph movement. Still disputed. I, I have not spent enough time with, uh, with the revival uh, pieces from Zenith, but I definitely will. Uh, I posted a, a picture of this one on Instagram and I'm surprised about the attention and uh, engagement this model actually received. Well done, Zenith. Very well done, Zenith. We're moving to Gerald Charles. And uh, I. It, it might be that it's not ringing a bell immediately with you, and I forgive you on that, but uh, <laughs> there is another name that will most definitely ring a bell, and that is Gerald Genta. Yeah. Gerald Genta was, of course, the brilliant watch designer uh, who brought us, um, well, a, ser a serious number of the iconic watches that we praise and that we cherish today, like the Royal Oak, like the Nautilus, the Ingenieur, Um, the Polaris the, of the, uh, Omega and uh, the uh, uh, Universal. The Pole Router. The Pole Router and uh, the Bulgari Bulgari, etc., etc., etc. Yeah. So Very productive we, man. If we move a bit further, he at, at some point in the 80s or 90s, he started his own brand, mm -hmm. Gerald Genta. And then we had this odd, real artistic watches, including, you already know, the, the, the Disney ones, the Mickey Mouse, etc. Sure. Very And nice he watches. sold his company in 2000 to Bulgari, alongside Daniel Roth. That was yes. a separate tra tra trajectory, but um, Bulgari ac um, acquired both names. And Mr. Genta had to move on with another name, and he chose his middle name, Charles. So, Gerald Charles was founded in 2003. And in six... 2006. They launched the Maestro. Yeah. And then in 2011, unfortunately, uh, Mr. Genta died. Mm. 
and the brand became dormant mm. until 2020, right? No, a little bit earlier than Did that. It's owned by an Italian family today, and they are actually reviving everything. The first models of the Maestro were Soprot. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you have to start somewhere. But now it's, it's uh, in this, in the, in the 2.0 and the 3.0, they actually have a Vosier movements. I'm not quite sure uh, who made the chronograph movement. We have to look into this. We just received the watches. It's brand new. Um, but it's, I see more Daniel Roth me too. In this one, than than uh, Shell Genta. Um, am I a fan of these? I like the oddity, and I like they don't look like anything else we have on the table. I don't like the straps. They're simply uh, t- too much silicon in the, in this in these straps. That they're, they're too soft. They don't scream luxury, which I I think the 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 watch itself really. Uh, demands. I tend to agree with you, but on the other side, um, the, the 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 watch wears very easily. This is a watch you put on your wrist, at least from my perspective, and you forget that you're wearing it, and that's a compliment because it is a very, as I see it, it's a usable watch, and I'm, I, I like oddities, I like odd watches, mm. and I really appreciate it, uh, um, the looks, but yeah. it has to grow probably, yeah, and. Um, I think it's uh, it's good that we have a uh, Gerald Charles around, and we will probably see more in the next few years. Looking at the table right now, I see a lot of green. A lot of green. Yeah, a lot of green these days. Tudor and Glashütte original. Take the Tudor. This is not bronze, ladies and gentlemen. This is the first, as far as I know, the first Tudor in eighteen karat gold. It's the Black Bay as we know it. It's the 41 millimeter. And if you didn't know it, you would think that this was a bronze uh, Black Bay because we've seen that before. But this is actually a little shy of 16,000 euros. It has the uh, Kennedy manufactured uh, automatic movement inside with silicium uh, hairspring, 70 hours of power reserve, uh, yada, 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 in gold. Quite impressive, of course, with that beautiful French tightly woven uh, 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 textile strap, which I really like. I appreciate there's no gold bracelet. And of course, a lot of the naysayers, they said, oh, I would have bought it if I had a gold bracelet. No, you wouldn't. You would have put your money into a gold Rolex on the pre-owned market. I know you would. Yeah. So this is a very special launch. But if you don't like gold, go for silver. See, I don't know if you are grandparents or maybe your parents or maybe yourself because you're an old fart like me. You have silver, uh, silvery in, in, in your drawers, in your kitchen. Um, this is also silver. And we know the trend about bronze and they tarnish in a yeah. different way. Yeah. Uh, very individually. See, I'm not quite sure what this silver alloy contains of other materials. It must have something that doesn't make it as soft Mm-hmm. That's a silver fork, if mm-hmm. you like. Mm-hmm. Uh, any any silver cutlery that you know from your kitchen. I like it. It's the 58. It's the 39 millimeters. It has a see-through case back, which is weird for a diver's watch. But don't worry about that. Absolutely. Uh, who dives with it anyway? I can't wait to see how this will look uh, just when I do like this. Is it going to be fun? Um, is it going to be black? Uh, so it's going to look like a PVD. Um, will it go? It won't go green like uh, bron- the bronze watches from from uh, all the brands. So, what do you prefer, silver or gold? Forty one millimeters, thirty nine millimeters. Tudor, Kennedy produced, manufactured movements, uh, great qualities, high in price, reasonable in price. Let's see what they look like in three or five years from now. Very interesting from uh, Tudor. They're doing everything that uh, Rolex would never do. That. So that's why the, the brand is also super interesting, not only to people who can't afford a, a Rolex, but indeed to people who can afford a Rolex, but also just love the little sister brand called Tudor. They deserve it. Yeah, they do. Okay, let's move to Glashütte Original. And Glashütte Original is a brand that we know, you and I, we know them very well. Yes. We, we are close to the brand already for years, visiting them on fairs, on, on, on the factory, which is quite impressive. And I think it's fair to say that we have a weak spot for them, right? So weak, actually, that I decided, uh, unpaid, mind you, to have a glass with original on the cover of my book that comes out in June. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. We do have a soft spot for them. I think we we do have a soft spot for a lot of watch companies coming out of Glashütte, former East Germany, very close mm-hmm. to the to the Czech border, very close to Dresden. This is not lange. Glashütte original is not lange. It's a very different animal because they have a lot of steel watches. They have ladies watches. They have probably more sport in them uh, than elegance, if you like, but they also have elegance. They also have uh, uh, tourbillons, etc., etc. But they're not as sophisticated in their complications as Lang und Söhne. Yeah. They live just next door to each other. Uh, and I think once in a while they share their employer. So this guy goes to uh, whatever. I love Glass Studio because of the versatility in their collection. Me too. Me too. And on what we have on the table right now, the strong colors. <laughs> well, that, that's that, they, they they have strong colors. We'll yeah. get to that because yeah. that that uh, yeah that goes in in surprising directions. But what we know, let's first look at the the Pano. Uh, here's the Panomatic Lunar. Yeah, but this uh, is in gold. This is gold. Yeah, so we have, we have seen it before. I was actually with. Uh, yeah, uh, the fact is, of course, Klaus Hütter does steel, but they are also very established in precious metals. Yes, like sir. Gold and platinum. Absolutely. They, yeah. they do limited editions, but also in the regular collections, yeah. gold is 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 very much used. Yeah. This is an example with with a beautiful green dial. Yeah. With a green sp- alligator strap as well. Yeah. Exactly. It's it's a little bit fumé, dégradé, if you like, uh, which. We are still seeing a lot. Actually, we also see in the 70s panoramic uh, date chronograph. Um, this is a really cool watch. When I put it on the wrist, it reminds me of my 5980 uh, Nautilus chronograph. It has that 70s, well, it's called 70s. Yeah. It has a 70s design and look and feel, almost like a you know a TV screen, if you like. Uh, but now on this bluish solarized dial, Uh, which the dials, mind you, are made in Forsheim. They have their own dial their factory. Their own dial factory, yeah. yes. So basically, they don't have to define um, their dials to a dial manufacturer. They make everything themselves. So they can come up with any any dial they want. Also a bright yellow. See, this is a matte yellow dial. I'm not particularly a fan of this one, but at least... After pandemic, this is a very happy watch. And we see that a lot. A lot of the bright colors. I think Rolex came out in 2020 with the um, uh, Oyster Perpetuals in, in uh, five or six different five colors, colors, depending yeah. on, on the diameter. Yeah. And now we're just seeing classic models coming out with bright, happy colored dials. Yeah, they already did, did this special treatment and also very special warm colors on the 60s. Yes, uh, they did. I love those. I love those. And those are also tend to be very, very popular. Yeah. Uh, regarding the 70s, I, I, it's funny that you compare it to your 5980 because yeah. um, I did that as well a while ago. I was checking again on, on the 70s and, and try to position what, what watch is it? How is it in the market? Mm. How does it feel? And it is really an alternative. If you are if you are uh, looking for something out of the ordinary, mm-hmm. but you want a steel sports watch from an established brand with very high level of finishing, yeah. then yeah, you can't go wrong with this one. No, it's, it's, uh, it's quite the looker. I like the 70s panoramic date uh, chronograph. Um, Also, I really dig their new straps. They are, it's it's like rocket suede, if you like. Yeah. I just last week, I had a talk with a strap maker for Mm. other reasons. So he explained some things about straps. And now I tend to pay more attention to it and see and compare it. This is a beautiful strap. Was that Nicolas Hirsch? No, no, no. Can you just hand me the the panel uh, with the moon face talking straps? That is, uh, it's a classic watch. We've seen it for, it's, it's been in the collection for quite a while. It's one of the staple horses, if you like a glass yeah. with or But now with a, not a soft per se textile strap, but a, again, a, a con, you know, it has this uh, wonderful structure on yeah. it yeah. Uh, it's still a, a very nice textile strap and what I like is like Carlo Grocco in uh, 1980 
He put a rubber strap onto a gold watch. Today we know it as a uh, Hublot Big Bang. The but art of then, fusion. The art of fusion. I like how you can change the look of a classical watch by attaching a very different strap. So this, you would probably probably see this a lot with a crocodile strap, which we have on this one, yeah. because it's somewhat a luxury watch. This is steel, of course. But you just want to put it on your wrist anyway during the weekend because it's a steel watch. So why not put a, a strap on it? Again, uh, you know, a textile strap on it. This reminds me of my dad going, you know, in the garden or we go sailing when, when I, was, I was a kid. He would wear a watch with a textile strap on it um, because it could get wet and, you know, you, you, you didn't matter if it was a bracelet or a crocodile strap. Yeah, yeah. It was just a textile strap, like your bathing trunks, if you like. That's how we like to use our watches. Yeah, as yeah. watches, of course, we Absolutely. love them as as precious uh, uh, objects and and investments. But yeah. ultimately, they are tools. That they you use. are supposed to be used. Yeah. Which one of all these? You. This is your own, so you, you can't say the Uhrwerk. No. So today is Friday, and when you uh, listen to this podcast, it will be Monday. But we are now going into a wonderful weekend, hopefully yeah. with some sun out. Which one would you wear? Wow. I would take this one. Why? Yeah, just my first impulse. Yeah. I, I like the watch. It's growing on me. Uh, as I said, I invested some time in, in studying the watch. And, mm. and of course, I know it for quite a couple of years, but I like the watch. So I would, I would, yeah, my first impulse is I would take this one for the weekends. And you, Christian? Well, I'm going camping with my youngest son. So I would probably go for the green watch. <laughs> I know it's gold, uh, but also I know that if I wore this, People would think it was bronze. So it's below the radar. This is your hidden luxury gem. You know that this is gold and not bronze. I kind of like that weird oddity that, that Tudor introduces with silver and gold. I follow you. I Nobody think, saw this coming. No. And that's, that's for me also about the passion for horology is that it's, it's actually very egoistic. You, pu you mainly do it for yourself. If yeah. you appreciate and, and, and admire your watch several times a day, who cares what the outside world thinks? True. We are definitely uh, over 20 minutes right now, boss man. Sure, any, last, any famous last words? No. I think it's uh, it was quite spontaneous. We had yeah. uh, a lot of different watches uh, happen to be in in the, in the office today. So we uh, still have a box in there with a lot more watches. I mean, it it it, it it's like the pandemic is slowly getting out of our ordinary lives these days and the watch brands they want to make sure that we do not miss any of the new watches coming out yet it's still proven that classic design still is the best next week i would like to discuss Jura perigo Ooh, for obvious reasons with the aston martin thing something like that something like that yes. and a crazy skeletonized tourbillon we're gonna have all the details next week. Yeah. Also, when we discuss that, we should discuss about that uh, triple bridge, Tourbillon, that was sold at an auction. I believe it was actually platinum of Chira Perigo that was sold at 18,000 euros. Ladies and gentlemen, that is less than a GMT Pepsi and Steel is sold for at the secondary market. Wake up, God damn it. Look into the high horology, see what you can get. What is the cheapest tourbillon you can find in the market? Buy it, if it's Swiss made, by the way. Thanks for listening. Yeah. And uh, glad Remember to see you to next Remember to subscribe. Week. Yes, okay. Yeah, yeah. Bye-bye.